turn to introducing the theory of statistical mechanics. So for this, we're going to look at the PowerPoint presentation I made. Um, so the idea is that you can describe the statistics of a system with a large number of particles, in this case, it's a kind of model of a gas. So you can describe the thermodynamics of such a system in terms of the statistics of what its particles are doing. That's the basic idea. So in this particular example, we consider particles in a box where they move with a constant velocity unless they collide. And if they collide, they collide just like pool balls, elastic collisions. So if you look here, you can see lots of different collisions between the particles. And you assume those are elastic. So this is a model of a, a gas, a classical model of a gas. And I want to look at its statistical properties. So, first of all, we can describe the microstate. Um, classically, you, in order, so the microstate is a complete determination of the state of every particle in the system. So I tell you exactly what that system is doing. Classically, in that case, I should tell you all of the velocities and all of the positions. Quantum mechanically, though, because of the uncertainty relation, I only have to tell you one set. So if this is a quantum mechanical problem, for example, I could just tell you the velocity of each particle in the gas. And that would give you a complete description of the state of this gas. I tell you the velocity of every particle in it. If we assume this system is closed, that means no energy or momentum is transferred in or out, then the total kinetic energy must be a constant. And kinetic energy is a half mv squared. You can ignore m if it's a constant, so I get that this must be a constant. But if you look at the picture, the animation I showed you on the previous slide, you see that the microstate is changing. I define the microstate in terms of the velocities of the particles, but when two particles collide, they change velocity. Right? So this particle is now moving up. But when it collides with another particle, it suddenly starts moving horizontally. So collisions change the microstate of the system. So each collision changes the microstate of the system. For example, I have two particles here with velocity v1 and v2. Initially, after they collide, they have some other velocities, v1 prime, v2 prime. So the microstate has changed. Now I draw this symbolically like this. Okay? The system starts off in some microstate with these velocities, and it ends up in some other microstate with some new velocities, with the prime here. So the state of the system is changed by collision. So as I go through, as I go through the whole thing, each time there's a collision, the state of the microstate of the system is changed. Each time two particles collide, the velocities of the system is changed. And therefore, the microstate the system is in is changed. So I can describe the evolution of the system in terms of the microstate it's in at each particular point in time. And each time there's a collision, the microstate is changed. Now, if I'd started the system with the particles in a slightly different configuration of positions, then other collisions are possible. Right? If I scattered them in a different way, and run the same simulation, then I could have got different results. So, for example, instead of going from this microstate into that microstate with a collision like this, I could have gone into a different microstate with a different kind of collision. So there were lots of different possibilities, different possible ways of going between microstates. So you get this big, complicated network, and each step is reversible. So if I can collide in this way, like that, I can also collide in the opposite way and go back into the same state. So, as I go forward in time and the collisions happen, I get this complicated network of microstates where I can scatter through collisions between the microstates in the network. Is that clear what's represented there? Each dot here is a statement about the velocities of every particle in the gas, when there's a collision, the velocities change, and I go into a new microstate. 
So each time there's a collision, I go into a new micro. I want to give a completely different example as well to give you the idea of how this abstraction helps. So another example I can consider is a power magnet. A power magnet is a material, something like iron, where each atom has a spin, so each atom has a magnetic moment, but at room temperature there is no net spin. So at room temperature the directions of the arrows are random. Some of them point up, some of them point down. Yeah, the direction is random. And we can assume that there's, well, for the ideal power magnet, there's no interaction between the spins. So in this case, a microstate, a microstate of this system is, I tell you what every arrow in the system is doing. So I say the first arrow is up, second arrow is up, third arrow is down, fourth arrow is up. That's a microstate. I tell you exactly what the system is doing. And how does the system evolve? Just like the gas can have collisions, I imagine that in this system there can be spin flip events. So at some point in time, one of the spins can suddenly change direction. So if it was pointing up, the spin direction can suddenly change to down. So in this case, I started out in microstate 1, where this arrow is down, and I went to microstate 2, where this arrow went up. So you see in this way, again, you get a network of different microstates and different ways of going between. For the case where I only have three atoms, I can be so simple I can actually draw the picture. In this case, there are eight different possibilities. Right? Each spin either points up or down, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I can draw them on the vertices of a cube, like this. And each time a spin flip event happens, I can go from this microstate, say, into this microstate, then to this one, then to this one. So each time a spin flip happens, I change microstate by moving around the edges of this cube. Okay. So, our general assumption is that any system can be described like this. For any system, there's a large number of microstates of that system, which I draw symbolically as these little dots, these little blue squares are microstates. So for a gas, this is telling you the velocities of all the particles in the gas. For a power magnet, it's telling you the direction of all the arrows in the power magnet. But it's a complete specification of the system. And we assume that there's a large number of them, and that they're connected in a... Well, there's a large number of connections between different microstates. Then, as time goes forward, the system changes microstates. So each time there's a collision in the gas, you change microstate, you move around this network. And we assume that this happens very fast. So in a gas, the number of collisions is very, very large. There are millions and millions of collisions every second in a gas. So you go through these microstates very, very quickly indeed. And this gas room is very fast. Finally, we assume that the changes between microstates are reversible. That means if I started in this microstate and went into this one, possible sometime later that I can go back to the original microstate with the same probability. If I go one way, then I can go back with the same probability. Okay, so this is our general abstract picture. So there are two terms which are very important. The first one is the microstate. The second one is the state. Okay. Microstate is a complete specification of every particle in the system. So I tell you everything there is to know about the system. I completely specify state. Uh, I completely specify every particle in the system. And for example, in a gas, then. This means I tell you every velocity. So I tell you what's the velocity of the first atom, what's the velocity of the second atom, and what's the velocity of the end atom. I completely specify the system. So 
Whereas the state, in this technical sense, is those properties of the system which you can see on a large scale. So large, and the technical word that's used for this is macroscopic properties of the system. So again, for a gas, state properties we're talking about are things like what's the temperature of the gas, what's the pressure of the gas, and so on. What's the entropy of the gas. The whole point of statistical mechanics the physics is to give you a way of going from the statistics of the microstate into the behavior of the state. So if you tell me, you know, at a certain point in time the velocity is all like this, how can I calculate from that information the temperature and the pressure of the system? That's the goal. If I know the behavior on the microscopic scale, how can I derive the behavior on the large scale? Now, critical to this is, is the point on the last slide here. If I have a network which looks like this, and we assume that this is a reasonable model of any kind of system, where there's a large number of points and I scatter between them, if these three things are true, the number of microstates is large, the system changes very quickly each time there's a collision, and the probability of going both ways is the same, then suppose at time zero I ask you what state the system is in, microstate, and you say it's here. Then one second later, I ask you where's the system now. So I start up in this state, this microstate. One second later, I ask you where's the system now. Because there have been many, many changes in microstates within that one second, and because these changes are, have equal probability in both directions, you can show that it has equal probability of being anywhere. So I start out here, then I start to scatter, and I scatter all around this network, and then I suddenly shout, stop, and we see where we arrive. Then, if these conditions are true, then I have equal probability of being anywhere within this network. Now, this result is known as the fundamental postulate of statistical mechanics. And it says the following. If I have such a network of microstates, and I let it run for some time, and then I stop it and look at what microstate it's in, then they all have equal probability. I can't... The probability of being any particular microstate is equal. So, in this case, suppose I have... 20 microstates here, the probability of each microstate is 1 divided by 20. They all have an equal probability because of the nature of the scattering between different microstates. Now this, as you can probably guess from the name, it's called the fundamental postulate. This is the most important idea in order to be able to derive the large-scale properties of a system from its microstate. So what we're going to do for the rest of this class then is look at some simple examples of systems where we characterize the full microstate and then use this fundamental postulate to show that what the large-scale properties may look like. So this is the, the goal of the rest of the course from now on. Okay, before we take a break, I just want to do one very simple example of how this fundamental postulate comes about. Very, a very simple example, but one which will capture all of the important points of the fundamental postulate. So I'm going to take a very, very simple system where there are only three microstates. So if I continue using the colouring that I used in the 
see the free mic space. Uh, let me do it. Let me take it. There are three microstates like this. Number one, two, number three. And I suppose I can scatter between them, so if I'm in this state, I can go this way or that way. I can go this way or that way. This way or that way. And I could also scatter back into the same microstate. So this is a very simple version of that network I showed you on the PPC. Right? There are three microstates, and there are various ways of scattering between them. So I can describe you the probability of changing between microstates by using transition probabilities. So the transition probability between microstates is constant in each time step. So we assume that in one time step, there's one transition event. So each time I click my fingers, the microstate will either change or decide to stay the same. And I give as an example some probabilities. Suppose I start in microstate 1, then a transition event happens. I suppose that the probability I stay in microstate 1 is 3, 6, or a half. Right? I suppose the probability I go from microstate 1 to microstate 2 is 2, 6. And I suppose the probability I go from state 1 to state 3 is 1, 6. So I started in microstate 1. I have a half probability of staying there, a third probability of going to microstate 2 and the sixth probability is going to make six. Now suppose I start in mic state two. Then the probability I go back to mic state one must be the same because of this reversibility condition. So the probability I go from two to one is also two six. But the rest is I can choose freely, so I assume the probability I stay at two is a six. And the probability I go to 3, 3, 6, and therefore if I start at 3, just to make sure the total probability is 1, the probability I stay there is 2. So this completely defines a network of microstates, three microstates, with per unit time the probabilities of transition between. <coughs> so I just want to see what happens as I take time steps forward, as the system evolves. Okay, so we start, we may as well start in number one. So we're going to start in my state one. Now what does it look like after one time step? Well, after one time step, I have a scattering event. I could either stay there, or I could go into states two or three. The probability I stay there is three six. The probability I go to number two is two six. The probability I go to number three is one. So, let me write it this way: the probability um, to be in microstate one. I'm going to write it this way, the probability that after one time step, I'm in state one, is just three six. Similarly, the probability to be in two, so this is the probability that after one time step, I'm in state two, this is two six. And the probability to be in microstate three, Hopefully that's clear, right? After one time step, I start it here. After one time step, the probability I stay there is 3, 6. That's this. The probability I went until number 2 is this. The 
probability I went into number three is this. Okay. So that's very simple. Um, it gets more interesting as we keep running. Okay, so this is 0 0.5, 0 0.33, this is 0.17. So now we do the calculation again. Again, we have a scattering event, so after two time steps, what does this look like? Well, I'm going to write this now probably after two time steps. I'm in state one. Probability that after two time steps, I'm in state one is one. Now this is a little bit more complicated because after two time steps there are different ways of going into state one. Right? I could have started in state one, then stay in state one, then stay in state one again. So I could go one, one, one. This probability is just 3, 6, that's the probability that I stay there, times the probability that I'm already there. So this is the probability that I was in 1, then I stayed in 1, and then I stayed in 1 again. But also, I could have started in 1, then gone to 2, and then gone back to 1. So I could have gone 1, 2, to 1. This is therefore the probability of going from 2 to 1 is 2, 6. And the probability that I was in 2 is P, 1, 2. So this is the probability of going from 1, 2, to 1. And then finally I could go from 1 to 3, to 1. And this one is 1, 6, 1, 3. And if you work this out, this turns out to be 14 over 36, which as a decimal is 0.39. So I'll just do one more, and then hopefully the pattern will become clear. After one more time step, I can just reuse this formula, right? This is now an iterative formula. After three time steps, Finally, after three times that, probability that I'm in one after three times that is the probability that I was in one and then I stay in one plus, plus the probability that I was in two and went back to one plus probability that I was in 3 and back to 1. And again, if you use these numbers, this one turns out to be 75 over 160. So the decimal is 0 0.35. Okay, and we can do it for the other ones. Probability that after three time steps I'm in two. I won't bother to write the formula again. Is turns out to be 72 over 260, which is a decimal of 0 three. And the probability that after three time steps I'm in state three is 69 over 260. So the point I wanted to make here is to look at the numbers of these probabilities. After one time step, they're all quite different. This one is three times more probable than this. So after one time step, these numbers are all quite different. But after two time steps, they get more similar. And after three time steps, they get more similar again. So hopefully you can believe me, and it's not too difficult to prove mathematically, that if I do four, five, six, seven time steps, then these numbers will all converge to the same number. So 
So all of these numbers are converging to t is equal to a third. as the number of time steps increases. Okay. And this is the point of the fundamental postulate. If the number of time steps is large, if the number of collisions or whatever which happen within my measuring interval is large, then when I sample the system, I find the microstate of the system, it has equal probability of being in any microstate. So, so that means they all have they all have equal probability. Okay. And this is exactly the statement of the fundamental postulate. The probability of each microstate should be equal. And we saw that in our model system, this is true. What are the important properties of the model system? Firstly, that you, s you have a large number of time steps to get equal probability. And secondly, the probability of going from 1 to 2 is the same as the probability of going from 2 to 1. It has this reversibility. And as long as these things are true, then you will get equal probability of each microstate. This is the content of the fundamental posture. So I now want to show you a, a PowerPoint presentation where I do the same kind of thing, but on a very large scale system. So here in this slide, you can see there were 100 microstates, and I've arranged them in a circle just for clarity. So these are 100 microstates, and I get the computer to, at random, make 300 connections between them. So I get the computer at random to choose two microstates and draw a line between them. And so, for example, the first microstate up here for some reason, I connect it to one, two, three, four, five, six other microstates. It shows them at random. Then the next one I connect like this. That means that this microstate is possible to scatter from this microstate into this one and back again. So just as I drew a line here from state one to state three, that means the same thing, right? I can go from state one to state three and back again. On the computer simulation, I can go from this point to that point. So I go around the circle and fit it all in. And when you finish, you end up with quite a mess. So this is 100 microstates with 300 connections between 300 possible ways of scattering. And I do exactly what I calculated before in the class. I start at a particular microstate, and I say that in each time step, the probability to change microstate is 1 divided by a certain number. I think in this simulation, this is 11. Divided by 11. So there's a certain probability to change, and I see what happens. So I start in microstate 10 for some reason. There I, I start in microstate 10. After one time step, I may be scatter. So I'm still probably in the same microstate with probability about 0.45, but I may have scattered into one of these other microstates, which have probabilities about 0.9. So this is after one scatter event. After the next event, it looks like this. Okay, so here it gets more complicated. There are other microstates. Some have a, quite a large probability. Some have small probabilities. But there are a large number of microstates I could be in. As I keep doing the kind steps now, after five it looks like this. You can see there's still quite a big variation between them. After ten it looks like this. Now they're starting to get more even. And if I keep running, 20, 30, I go. And after 100, you see that they're virtually all the same probability. So in this simulation, after 100 time steps, I end up with virtually all the same probability. And this again is the fundamental postulate. After I scatter a large number of times, I have equal probability to be in any microstate. Now, this is kind of related, it's not so essential, but it's interesting. There are some issues in this if the number of possible ways of scattering is not large enough. So in this case, again, I took 100 microstates, but I only made 80 connections. So you see there are far fewer lines. 
Now, in this case, the behavior is a little bit different. After 10 states, it looks like this. After 50, like this. After 100, like this. So remember in the previous simulation, where there were 300 connections, after 100 time steps, it was virtually all the same. But if the number of connections is small, then after 100 time steps, there's still a big difference in probability. And after 200, still, it takes until about 500, micro, 500 time steps until I get roughly equal probability. So, if the number of connections or the type of connections is limited, then the convergence is slow. It takes a long time to get this equal probability of microstates. And secondly, not all microstates can be reached. You see, there are some microstates here which have zero probability. The reason for that is easy to understand. If you look at the original network, you see that some microstates are impossible to reach. Right? Like this one here, I can't get into it. There's no line connection. So I can't possibly get there. These are the same. This one's the same. There are also other microstates which only have one possible way of scattering. So if you look at this one down here, this one can scatter into this one, but that's it. So these two microstates can only scatter between each other. They can't go anywhere else. So if the number of connections is not large, you can get kind of stuck. You can't reach all the possible microstates. Uh, and I mention this because this kind of behavior is important in phase transition. What happens in a phase transition, for example, when gas turns into a liquid, is that some parts of the space of microstates become inaccessible. So there is some separation between microstates you can reach and those which you can't. Similar to this behavior. 